And just a quick uh, question in chat, will the recording be available to participants after the webinar? Absolutely, it'll be posted on our webinar library on the Forest Stewards Guild website. And it'll also be on the Forest Stewards Guild's uh, YouTube page. It may take me until Thursday to get those there, but they will be available. All right, so I'm gonna turn it off to you, Roger, and um, thank you so much for being willing to lead this webinar. I'm telling you all, this is one dedicated guild member here. Uh, and he's got a lot of great information to share tonight. So um, without further ado, I'll just turn it over to you and give you a time check in about 40 minutes, Roger. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Every Picture Tells a Story, Don't It? <laughs> Thank you, Scottish rocker Rod Stewart, for the inspiring title. I'm Roger Merchant from Bangor, Maine. You know, first boxcar, midnight train, destination, Bangor, Maine. I'm a man of no means, king of the road. Well, enough of that. This evening, we're going to explore the art and application of photography to forests and place-based photography. Briefly, here's my story. I'm a mix of this and that through a professional lens. Dad gave me a slide camera for high school graduation in 1965. With camera in hand, I recorded my footprints through a variety of locations and environments over my lifetime. In six, 1965, I graduated UMaine, stepped into the woods and managed 100,000 acres of trees and forest. In 1968, I uncovered a 15-acre old-growth forest in Township 3, Range 7, which remains protected today under the Maine Bureau of Public Lands. I survived the Cultural Revolution of the 60s and 70s, completed an MSW in Social Work Community Development in West Virginia. And by 79, I integrated these diverse aspects of my curious being through a 32-year career with UMaine Cooperative Extension in Piscataquis County. In 1980, I began photographing Maine's mountains and rivers, streams and forests from New Brunswick on the east to Quebec on the west. Having practiced forestry, I noted large-scale changes in our forests and began photographing landscapes at selected sites across the state. Before the turn of the century, I had also noted that older forests were becoming increasingly rare. Whoops, get back here. Thank you. Protecting old growth forests at, time, at that time, however, was not a popular idea in forestry circles. In 1998, I found an isolated 200-acre old-growth forest, which was slated for future harvest. Giving my public role, I agonized over what to do to protect this unique forest. So I camera cruised the 200 acres, generating 500 images of the Big Wilson Forest. I selected 35 representative photos, wrote a forestry assessment, and submitted this to five related state agencies. Eventually, by 2008, it became deed protected in perpetuity. Big Wilson Forest and Township 3 Range 7 remain my old growth forest legacy in Maine. For me, photography has played a key role in documenting, teaching, influencing, and protecting forests and forest legacy. So where are we going tonight? Forest photography is an effective means for capturing informative images about trees, forests, and forest conditions, and conveying this to the public. Through some visual and verbal short stories tonight, we're going to explore forestry and photography details, framing and composition, editing points, compelling forest documentation, as well as seeing how local people can become engaged in photographic storytelling. Regardless of camera type, I hope you will find something to take home for your forest photography toolbox. Keep in mind the hearts and minds, if you will, whoops, keep jumping around here a little bit. Keep in mind the hearts and minds of the layperson, the public, the forest owner with little forestry training. Consider what words and photographs may connect with and inform your public audience. I will show and tell for about a half hour, then we'll break for a few questions before stepping into the second half of the photography community engagement storytelling program. This will be followed by more questions and wrap up. Thanks to the Forest Guild and Colleen Robinson for supporting me and bringing this to you. 
I also want to acknowledge and extend a heartfelt thank you to the people of the Wabanaki Confederation who have taken care of Maine, New Brunswick for us for thousands of years post-glacial pre-colonial. I'm grateful to the Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq tribes for their being good keepers of the earth and forest over many millennial cycles. So, this single image captures my encounter with natural visual chaos when I was documenting winter in the Big Wilson Forest in 2008. This older forest had park-like stands of pine, hemlock, and floodplain hardwoods. It also had many under-the-story, overstory views like this single image, busy with many species, ages, and stages occupying the visual structure of the forest. As I took this photograph, it came clear to me that the significant challenge in forest photography is learning how to see and cut through its natural visual chaos. Now I'm gonna take a hard right twist in the chaos story by revealing a series of photos of the chaotic pre-Christmas windstorm that recently hammered Maine. As you will see, this short visual verbal sequence informs and connects us to the rapidly warming climate and its impact on forest stability in the winter. At the height of this blowing in the wind moment, I stepped onto the deck for a safety check as our house was surrounded by big pines. This wide angle shot, 28 millimeters, captures two trees tipping over and tangling up in some adjacent pines. So I exited the exposed deck, zipped around the backside of the house to see where the trees might land. If all hell broke loose, and it did, right down on me. The 90 mile an hour wind shook the two pines loose. They crashed into the house 30 feet in front of me. The crown snapped off at the peak of the roof and solid wood was falling down all around me. 40 minutes later, the wind subsided and I had six big pines on the house. The broken kitchen skylight shattered glass all over my wife and myself. Now, as dramatic as this sequence of storytelling photos is, and it is, the next single photo reveals the deeper story about the chaos of a warming climate. Digging deeper underfoot, you immediately see hypersaturated, soaking wet soil with absolutely no frost in December. Imagine for a moment you're an 80 foot tall white pine standing exposed in the midst of a wet, warm, wild windstorm in December with no frost in the soaked ground and hurricane winds buffering all the needles in the dense crowns. What's left to hold you up? Timber. By contrast, consider this historic field night note about frost in the ground from the late 1960s when he was taking care of Baskegan lands. At that time, it was a known fact of logging life that somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas, the forest and wet ground would freeze and stay frozen into March. Frost and frozen ground tended to keep trees upright in cold winter storms. This year, Reports of logging activity indicate warm, very limiting conditions for the logging part of the forestry equation. One pine busted my canoe, which had traveled the Penobscot River from the Quebec border to Gulf of Maine over 28 days in 1994. We paddled and photographed the longest reach of the river from source to sea, delivering watershed programs to schools along the way. The purpose was to help people open their minds and grasp the extent of the river and forested watershed through photographs. Now back on the post windstorm front, some 300 feet west of the uprooted pines in my broken canoe, these large, dense, less exposed, mutually supportive pine trees protected us from the potential of an even larger apocalypse in our wee woods. Recently, we inventoried this two acre forest and determined our suburban forest was contributing 120 tons to carbon storage. Not bad for the little forest people, eh? <laughs> well, anyway, this single photograph also clearly illustrates how to use trees in a forest scene for effectively framing an informative image 
about older trees and forests. In the aftermath of all this visual, physical, emotional, climactic chaos, natural beauty and wonder still prevails in our wee woods. So let's shift lenses and explore the visual composition and some more forest scenes. This New Brunswick landscape is composed of two distinct young forests, one coniferous, one deciduous. Clear visual details in a single photograph like this can easily reveal forest facts to the layperson. In this example, both forests are young and thick with small trees, but forests is called even aged. The coniferous trees on the left are not dense like the deciduous on the right, as the darker conifers have been thin. A closer look at the deciduous forest reveals the distinct tree bark colors of white birch, yellow birch, and aspen in the mix. From a photographic perspective, this photo has strong, engaging lines of visual tension. They pull your eyes into it. The road dead center visually draws the eye of the forester, the layperson, the photographer from foreground to background, back and forth, left and right. Who might be that lone tree in the distance? This photograph reveals forest details on a floodplain. Compared to the Nubundric image, this photo is visually flat. A line of tension is horizontal, left and right. That's about it. When you and or a layperson dig into this scene, you can see the depth and fine texture of the soil supporting this hardwood forest. That edge just above the water and where the forest is growing out of it, that long edge there, it's about four feet. This, if this, if, the day I had taken this photograph had been clear sunshine. The shadows would have taken the soil details out of it. I wouldn't have seen that. But on an overcast day, it reveals the shade has lightened up and the colors have come through. So the timing of a photograph and the lighting is really, really important. So you can see the texture of the soils which support an observable mix of diverse forest species which are structurally composed of a diversity of small to large diameters and tree height sizes. In forestry language, we refer to that as uneven aged northern hardwoods. On the other hand, this single image is a place-based photograph which symbolically captures the natural visual essence of Piscataquis County, Maine. Its rolling landscape of mountains, rivers and valleys, streams, farms and forests, wetlands, rural roads and life. Place-based is about people and their environment. Here's an important note on image composition, particularly with forests. There is this distinction between composing a scene for a hand sketch watercolor painting and composing it for a photograph. The hand sketch artist, like here in this example, gets to choose what to put onto the canvas. The photographer is given the scene as is and needs to choose what to frame in and frame out of the camera viewfinder in order to simplify and amplify the forest subject. Some basic composition considerations in forest photography are found in SCCL. Simplify, get closer, prop, less is more. This scene is rich in trees. As an illustrative wide angle photo, 35 millimeters, it captures the context of the diverse species found in a mixed wood forest. But sometimes too many trees can overwhelm the interpretive informative possibilities of a forest scene. This is where SCCL comes in as you reframe the scene through your camera viewfinder out in the field. By moving closer, cropping out both sides and some of the sky, this simplifies composition and amplifies forest details as seen in this example. This photograph in the Big Wilson Forest is full of older trees. Plus, it has interior under the crown open spaces that draw your eyes outwards and upwards and into the visual details that constitute the ground, the crown, the trees of this 
floodplain forest. This next one's interesting. The late autumn landscape reveals a multitude of layers and interpretive possibilities, near, far, left, right, up, down. Larch being last to color and shed needles inserts a notable slash of orange across this complex landscape. When I took this photo, I framed and composed it to illustrate the complexity of the landscape surrounding the larch. In the next framing breath, I recalled SCCL's four actions that simplify photographs. So I walked down the road, stepped this way and that and then the other, framed and reframed the scene through my camera to simplify and amplify the subject. Then I set up my tripod, turned on the camera shutter, self-timer for image stability, step back and exposed, which yielded this simplified, amplified subject, large. Again, and from a very different perspective, these high contrast white and yellow birch trees underscore the essence of SCCL in forest photography. Simplicity, closer, crop, this is more. Here's a short twist of change in the forest. My first photograph of Big Wilson Forest was taken right here in 1998. You're looking at the whole of that forest south of the railroad there down to the stream. To my eye, bud color leaf break in spring is one of the most lovely impressionistic times in the woods. I have a collection of sites that I visit and photographed often. This first image with amplified saturation reveals the subtle red buds of red maple and brown buds of other hardwoods all starting to fatten and color up in the spring scene. Note the clarity of the railroad track in the upper right corner as we walk through the next 21 days. 12 days later, the reds and browns are becoming overwhelmed by the emerging greens and yellows of large aspen and white birch, which have been influenced by the history of railroad forest fires from the CP adjacent to us. This remote, remote isolated location plus the railroad extreme curves and rock cuts were factors that excluded this old forest from logging. Signs of harvest were not to be found on the ground in the state's assessment of Big Wilson Forest. Four more days of heat and some added saturation amplifies the color palette as more leaves unfold and begin to fill branches in the dense crowns. Some of the large gray trees standing in the scene are mature aspen and birch, which are now dying back due to maturity, old age. I'm not there yet, thank you. 21 days from April 28th, the railroad in the upper right has nearly disappeared under the expanding crowns. Tree crown colors are starting to trend away from yellow green towards that deeper sea of green that defines woods in the winter. This bee, the forest of spring. My photographic work illustrates changes in the size, scale, and impact of logging technologies. This can be a touchy point when speaking of logging and its role in forestry. When I started in the 1960s, skitters were small agile tools for forwarding tree stems from selective harvest. Today's cabin closed machines are productive and have minimized one of, the, one of logging's highest historic costs, the loss of human life. I know this fact well, as I have witnessed this on site in the woods. This wide angle landscape photograph reveals an industrial scale footprint. The ongoing concern has been the impact of fragmentation on forest cover and habitats. In recent times, tree-to-tree -tree connections through that extensive web of mycelia underground, as well as warming forest temperatures, all add complexity to what a whole forest is about and will become in the near and long-term future. It's mind-boggling for this person who started out in 1965 as a cords and logs forester. I even wrote a song about it. I work the North Woods and a decent chance, honest living and a honky tonk dance, drinking a beer, firing my saw, 200,000 white pine logs. Thanks to the late 
Orland Dwelly from Wait, Maine, the Lion contractor who inspired the words that I put into that song some years ago. Yeah. A lighter footprint like this, small skidders in the 60s were the tool of choice beyond historic horse logging. Both had huge safety concerns. On my watch, all trees harvested were marked and inspected weekly. Tree marking met silvicultural objectives and provided a basis for quality control in harvesting and overall forest management. This single photograph of a spruce fir stand was composed to reveal and convey three generations of human engagement. Ten years ago, I visited this harvested site and photographed, number one, the small pre-commercial stems and small stumps within the taller adolescent spruce fir forest, generation number two. I also noted larger or older stumps from an earlier harvest. I determined they were from my forest watch 35 years earlier. Pretty humbling to touch down again when your boots and paint gun hit the ground. How do we come to terms with public perceptions about the visual impact of harvesting? This is hard when any and all harvesting get labeled as evil, the dark side of the forest. But this topic in and of itself can constitutes a separate webinar, webinar. Excuse me. However, looking to the future, it will likely take a very thoughtful approach to forest planning and harvesting to maintain the long-term diversity of species, sizes, and ages that are needed to support and nourish overall forest health and productivity, especially in the face of rapidly warming climate and its impact on trees and forests, oxygen production, soils, mycelium, carbon, habitats, and watersheds. There's a lot of budgets to manage there. Close up, I frame this seedling and carbonized wood stump to symbolize the idea that taking care of a tree and forest takes time multiple lifetimes. And as the song goes, who's got time on their hands? Are we thinking and acting on taking care of force across multiple lifetimes? In the public's mind's eye, is the idea of growing trees and harvesting forests easy or hard for them to envision and accept? Standing in this single photograph for a minute, how might we bring to life the idea of change over forest time? As you already know, single photographs arranged in a visual sequence can reveal some of this story as we begin to step back further in time, before going forward in time, along with the forest. Photographic sequences can play an informative role in breaking through some of the barriers surrounding harvesting trees while taking care of forests over long periods of time, what I call forest time. Yeah, I think I saw Clay is here. Good, Clay, good to see you wherever you may be. There you are. Okay, let's look at an image submission from private landowner Clay Bainziger. I hope I got that right. Concerning the impact of a 20 acre, 25 acre fire on his land and forest in April 2022. Before the fire, we see his ponderosa pines with mountain mahogany bushes and native grasses down at ground level in the foothills, I believe, of the Rockies in Colorado, if I got it right. Thank you. The same view two years post-fire reveals the transition zone between the higher intensity burn on the right and the lower intensity burn on the left. From a photographic perspective, Clay composed two excellent before-after photos. He also employed the rule of thirds in placing the large green ponderosa pine in the left one-third of the scene. We'll do more on this later. I cropped Clay's after photo to get closer to the fire intensity boundary. As Clay explained, the needleless pines in this scene succumbed in the first year post-fire. Those pines with browning needles succumbed in year two. Large of the healthy green pines were minimally impacted by fires across this landscape scene. Good work. Good photographic work, Clay. Let's 
explore some more editing tips in forestry and photography. I sat on a ledge looking at this spring forest scene. It had subtle bud leaf colors and distinct tree shapes. I visually identified some species and took a snapshot. When I offloaded the original, it was dull, had little to no potential. Curiosity got the creative part of me, so I uploaded the original into editing, then bumped up the light, the saturation, and the sharpness levels, which yielded a more distinct, detailed, engaging forest photograph. Editing has a role. What I shot in the field and edited at home sparked an idea about tree identification in the spring, which I coded onto this informative image, spruce, fir, red maple, ash, white birch, etc. When you create a high quality informative forest photograph, make an eight by 10 print, laminate it, put it in your field pack trip. Why? A larger print will have more visual impact on the viewer than a small iPhoto screen. No offense intended to iPhoto fans. I'm one of them too. Earlier back on that ledge, I also framed, composed, and exposed some digital photos of a similar forest scene, but some 300 yards west of this site, which yielded this beautiful forest landscape photograph. It's up on my website, which in my mind, heart, and soul is an artistic rendering of the natural beauty found in forests of spring. Hope we're doing all right on time. Yeah, I think so. I want to give you the crash course on Google Earth editing. Why? Because I've seen Google Earth pictures put up there in presentations that have had no editing. An indistinct sea of green is often found on many unedited Google Earth photos. Like this, dull, not very engaging. Here's how to edit and amplify it. Note, in the upper left corner, note the bell curve with three index arrows underneath. This curve is about light distribution in the image. Darker tones to the left, lighter to the right. To balance the light-dark mix, pull the light side index icon over there at 255 to the left, where it intersects the bottom of the bell curve. Likewise, pull the dark side index icon over to the right, where it intersects the bottom of the curve. That yields this amplification of light and color. Now note where the dark, 15, and the light, 80 index icons, are located under the bell curve. Light and color are two key editing functions for most photo forest photographs from Google Earth. This amplifies the viewer's perception of forest details. To my eye, the green and yellow are still overwhelming. So I pulled down the hue saturation bar and selected auto color correct, which changes the sea of yellow to green, almost forest green. If you go back to saturation, slide it all the way to left, you remove all color from the photograph. Then compare this with a 1997 black and white photograph from Google Earth, which I accessed from the time history index found on most pages. There's a bit of change in time and circumstances here. The history index allows you to select other images from earlier years, each with distinct, distinct colors and clarity from different seasons of the year over time. Okay, that's the Google Earth crash course. The photographs in the 1942-2013 forest document and compare landscapes in the Piscataquis watershed in central Maine. Images in this project were re-rendered from GSAF in 1942 and Google Earth in 2013. Observations of these photographs reveal 71 years of change in forest cover, composition, and habitat. The collection covers the entire watershed. I began exploring and developing this photographic work at the edge of the analog di digital age. The USGS map is a classic aerial photography index showing the extent of red flight lines and photo centers, as well as the dark blue watershed boundary. In addition to forests and farms, this watershed is recognized for its historic significance as a spawning waters for the Atlantic salmon within the greater Penobscot watershed. Do changes in forest cover over time affect their habitat? I don't know. 
I'm not a researcher nor an expert in this, but I have made some photographs that visually step into this question. Here's a digitized photograph of an original GSAF print that covers Barren Mountain, where the Appalachian Trail runs north-south. As previously shown in Google Earth editing, I applied dark light balancing, then desaturated the image 100%, which removed the dull off-color tone of the aging original photographic print. Again, editing forest photographs is about amplifying details and clarity. Next, I selected and framed an area around a small pond on one of the images. I cropped, edited it, and copied it into my comparisons folder. Next, I took a slide, a screenshot of the exact same image in Google Earth, cropped, edited it, and copied it into the folder. Then I uploaded both images side by side, which yielded this photographic evidence of change in forest conditions since 1942, when compared to the same location in 2013. 71 years of forest time and change. The thing that's so obvious to me in the historic photograph is the extent of continuous uninterrupted, uninterrupted forest cover on most of the photographs that are a part of that collection. There's a lot to unpack here about forest and habitat fragmentation, soils, water quality, temperatures, carbon storage, etc. Likewise, with all due respect and, and an apology, I did not plan on addressing this deeper topic in this webinar. Informed by 1942-2013, this composite image is an art photography story about people, purposes, forests, and logging in the woods, stretching from pre-colonial pre Wabanaki people to the current times. Admittedly, there are a lot of people, not a lot of people in my forest photography, but there's more to the story. I want to cite an example where World War II and current satellite photographs play an informative role in clarifying eco-biological factors that are being influenced by warming climate in the black spruce tundra zone of Alaska. Good Lord, that's a far away. Ben Rawlins's tree line highlights seven key species around the globe that are shifting their tree lines in the face of warming climate. The author cites biologist Ken Tape, who has been tracking and digging into the black spruce tundra tree line. Tape had been seeking a historic baseline for measuring vegetation changes in the tundra zone. As he said, I spent a lot of time with my head in the tundra, but he felt that he had been missing the bigger picture about longer term changes. In 1998, he discovered a collection of USGS aerial photographs photography covering the entire north slope of Alaska in 1940. They reviewed and compared them to the exact same current satellite images. This revealed the fact that over the past 50 years, the open tundra has erupted with shrubs. Tate wondered what else might be moving with this shrub explosion. Moose, bear, beavers, what the heck? He and a specialist dug deeper into the World War II photography and were blown away by what they discovered. There were no beaver ponds in this spruce fir tundra line zone in 1940 compared to current satellite photographs, where the tree line zone had become occupied by beaver dams, ponds, shrubs, and trees. Indeed, there is more to be covered and learned here. The forest photography point is that both historic and satellite photographs have a key important role to play in assessing and documenting forests over time, especially in this ongoing era of forest climate change. I mean, what the heck? When I was in forestry school, we, we never had a class in forest history. Let's visually step closer to documenting warming atmospherics. Number Five Mountain is a wild remote location in the working forest of the Upper Moose River Basin in Maine's Boundary Mountains. My first time up there was by phone wire in the 1980s. I mean, it was fall and there was snow on the ground and the trail, you couldn't tell where it was, but there was these loops of phone line that came through the surface of the snow every now and then. And I said, that goes to the fire tower. So I'd pull that up for, expose it for 300 feet and then go up and do that again. That's how I went up to the summit the first time on number five. That was a long day. Autumn, early winter provides first rate opportunities for hiking, 
landscape photography and further interpretation and appreciation for Maine's remote working forests. Ah, oh, what can I say witnessing a moment like this that fills the human heart, mind, and soul? After decades up and down and around number five, I visited again this summer at peak season for smoke on the water, fire in the sky. My choice was intentional. I wanted to capture the observable, radically altered atmospheric conditions that I could see through my eyes and feel in my lungs. This be the results of that day from the summit of number five. Got it? The picture tells the story. Choking on a moment, I wonder how this smoke affects the breathing of trees that exhale oxygen, store carbon, as well as our own human inhaling of oxygen produced from these forests. When was the last climate change meeting where folks were asked to take in some easy breaths of oxygen while quietly giving thanks to all the trees around the globe that give us this essential life-supporting element? Is that this not part of that change in relationship that we have been hearing about? A change in our relationship with trees and forests and what we value? Just for a moment, quietly, take a couple breaths in. I need a few myself and out. Why are you taking that oxygen in? Out. Give thanks to the trees that keep you alive and me alive. And everybody in this room, well beyond. Yeah, smoke on the forest. I want to conclude with a creative note about photographing forest values. Values are about people and what they cherish most about life, family, and forest. Values inform decisions. In 2012, Dr. Sandy Smith, Penn State University, created a deck of forest story cards from photographs that amplify specific forest values. She used this as a means for promoting, expanding dialogue with many people about forests, particularly their story about what they care about and value concerning their forest. This is but a small sample of the many images in Dr. Smith's deck of forest story cards. First and foremost, consider that a landowner's values inform and guide them about what matters most in their taking care of land and forest. So, following her instructions, I went through the whole forest card deck, pulled out four pictures that smoke, spoke to me about our two-acre forest. These four photos reflect what we value, cherish, and hold close to our minds and hearts about our wee woods in Glenburn, Maine. We've got active pond life. My wife and I love forest flowers. Our grandkids love to play in the woods. And as you've heard, we store 120 tons of carbon. That's what forest values are about. Interesting. Forest values can get complicated when a community, land trust, or organization solicits public input for ideas concerning what to do with the town forest or a local land trust or conservation easement. Again, remember, forest values inform and guide landowner decisions about taking care of their land and forest, public or private. So, that's kind of the end of the PowerPoint show. I guess I'm supposed to hit that, end it. And... Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Um, yep. We have a couple of minutes for questions. If um, folks want to jump in with a question before we move on to the next section, which will be a video that Roger's going to share with us. If you have a question, you can put it in chat. Or you can use the raise hand reaction. All right, Clay, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. 
Um, so I thank you for showing the uh, the images I sent, and I tried to send rather uh, straight images from the editing. I think my background is perhaps slightly more edited. One of the challenges that I always run across, and uh, just with an associate's degree in photography, and and then just a, a lazy person lifetime of reading forest research reports and the like to manage my woods is for documentation photography purposes is there any heuristic that you have for how much editing's too much uh trying to call attention to uh say a macro photography shot you know really trying to get focus and contrast or mm -hmm. um, trying to show you know in this case atmospheric effects here you know just of a, a fog storm rolling through in the middle of the day Sounds to me like your question. Can you hear me okay? Indeed. Yes. Okay, so it, it sounds to me like your question is uh, focusing perhaps that there's how, how much is enough and how much is too much in terms of documentation and that kind of thing. I guess part of that depends on the context of what the story is about that you want to convey. But uh, in the case of your two photographs, um, we could have gone another level and crawled down through all of those grasses and shrubs and whatever down at the ground level. Um, and so if you're trying to capture what I would call the layers of a whole forest that include the soil, it includes the grasses, um, includes the litter on top and the seedlings and the shrubs, you know, um, I can see doing that just because of the heck of it out of the interest of doing it but it also tells a specific story a place-based story for you about where you're at and part of the question might be do you wish to share that with other people in thinking about what you want to include in a documentation series, keeping in mind SCCL, the simplicity is that's important too. So you have to make decisions there. Does that does that help? I, I think about it. I think so. I think the biggest challenge I have, and um, I think for many here on the the webinar, is um, making sure that as a layperson, I can still take useful photographs for the professional. I suppose you can take photographs for you, your family, the professionals, whoever. Um, and, but what's important too, I, I think, to remember, as I think pointed out early on, if you have an idea in mind as to who the audience of interest might be for what you're looking at investing your time and energy into, um, that re developing that relationship and interacting with those people to find out what they're particularly interested in or might be interested in in terms of what you have to share with them um that's a way of building a relationship with your neighbors so to speak <laughs> they don't do much of that here in rural maine although i guess there's exceptions to it but everybody sort of keeps to their property line that's it you know but um, I can see where if you have an idea of audience and that audience can, and it's not exclusive one way or another. It also can be your particular uh, personal self-interest in it. Um, and, 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 and that's valid. I mean, I've got, I don't know how many tens of thousands of images sitting here that I haven't even pulled into the editing field yet, let alone the collection of slides that came before that. Does that help? Yeah, there's a lot. Thank to you it. very much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've got a few more questions in chat, so we'll take a couple more now um, and save some for the end as well. Right. Kathy asks, can you say more about the difference between crop and get closer? Ah. Well, Cropping in photo editing, cropping is one of the considerations you make in the editing process in terms of perhaps reducing the size and scope of the edges around the image. Cropping comes out of that, uh, but it also can come out of your camera viewfinder when you're out in the field and you're looking at a scene, you can move closer, you can move further back, 
and like that photograph of the older forest after the windstorm there that came up in the beginning of the program, um, I moved in a little closer towards those trees that formed a natural frame on either side of the image. So you can do it in an editing program with the uh, crop function, and you can do it with your camera's viewfinder. I mean, I'm, geez, Joseph, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm old school. <laughs> Man, that old, no, not really. But what I was schooled in about photography was that when you bring that viewfinder up to your eye to look at a scene, to make some decisions, you move around, maybe you go in and out, this and that. You frame that down so that hopefully when you take that picture, it has the right dimensions for what you're trying to capture and it has the right lighting and camera settings so that the final image that comes out of that does not need a lot of cropping. Does that help? Thank you, Roger. Um, David shares more of a statement. Mm -hmm. Your before and after images are very precise and very well done. How do you remember location, framing, and angle, and so forth? <laughs> That's a challenging question for sure. <laughs> um, as far as remembering the images, um, I've addressed that uh, from way back. Uh, when I got into computers, uh, remote hard drives, I, uh, I noted that, uh, from my reading initially, I was pretty ignorant about a lot of stuff and still am, but, um, people were offloading their photographs and they were digitally time-wise, uh, uh, organized from today till back then sequentially by time. And I'm looking at all these dates there and I'm saying to myself, this isn't working for me. I'm not doing this. I'm not going down this road. And what I began to do is when I offload photographs, um, I will take and put them into particular categories. I have uh, extensive files on trees, forests, forest types, timber harvesting, et cetera, all under forestry. So I, my, my work is organized by subject matter that's how I know where the locations are for the most part. Um, I haven't done a lot with entering data onto the data you can enter in behind those cards, uh, but those are ways of keeping track. I, I have a place-based orientation uh, to my work that way. So time after time after time, man, I can't keep track of that. It doesn't speak to me. What? This photograph is what? Uh, 13, 24, 22. Give me a place. I can recognize that and relate to that easily. Give me a face. I can recognize that and relate to that. Is that some help? Thanks, Roger. We'll find out. Hey, okay. um, I'm going to stop your sharing. Yep and start my own so we can start a um, video here. You want me to start to read the introduction? Yep, will you please inter introduce the video? That'd be great. Okay, nine tips for telling stories through photos and videos introduces you to a planned approach for connecting people and community with practices and solutions that promote conservation. Nine Tips was formulated by the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program of African, Caribbean, and Pacific states. While not strictly forestry oriented, this excellent presentation will provide you with additional tips and tools, as well as guidance around how to effectively engage local people in the conservation storytelling process using photographs and videos. After the video, we'll open it up to more questions and comments. Yeah. Okay. Great. EDM is to effectively communicate the project we are developing in Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific. By producing better photos and videos, 
we will be able to effectively share our stories and solutions to achieve a brighter future for people and wildlife. You don't need to have extensive professional equipment to make the most of this course. In fact, with these nine top tips, you will be able to turn your Mm. I think I lost audio from you, Colleen. Yeah. Tip focuses on how to tell a visual story. Good stories grab one. Is that back? Yep, I... it, well, yep it came back. Okay. Attention. They rouse emotions and are remembered. To help show what we are doing and to encourage good sustainable wildlife management practices, we need to tell engaging stories. These could combine images, video, words to become multimedia stories. So the first question to ask is what do you want to say? Or in other words, what is your story about? It's important to think about this and write down your ideas before you pick your smartphone or digital camera. Try and answer this question in your notes. Who, when, where, what, how and why? These will be the building blocks for your story. So once we have identified these elements, how do we structure a story? Think about how you would tell the story to a friend or a relative in an easy to understand and captivating way. One simple and effective storytelling approach is to use a three act structure where you plan a beginning, middle and end or an opening challenge and resolution. For example, in the opening, at the beginning we present our characters and the place where the story is set. Secondly, for the challenges, in the middle we discover what they are facing and show how they are trying to overcome the challenges. Thirdly, in the resolution, at the end, we draw together the lessons learned and maybe include a call to action. Here is a simple example using video clips from our SWM project in Guyana. At the beginning, we meet our main character, Asaf. We show where he lives and find out that he is an indigenous hunter and conservationist. In the middle, we discover that wildlife populations are in decline and that they are threatened by wildfires and access roads. At the end, we see that there is hope for the futures if the conservation measures he advocates are put in place. The second tip focuses on equipment. Our tip is to keep it simple. The SWM project sites are typically in remote and difficult to access places. There may be no regular electricity supply to recharge batteries and no vehicles to carry your equipment. The two main setups we will focus on here are the digital camera and the smartphone. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Smartphones are highly portable, easy to use and not very intrusive. On the other hand, digital cameras allow you to use different lenses and have more settings to help you control your work. You can take great photos and capture great video with both. Whichever you are using, remember to set it at the highest possible quality. For video, this means either 4K or 1080. For photographs, shoot it in RAW rather than compress JPEG files if you can. If you're using a smartphone, hold it horizontally when you're shooting, as most TVs and computer screens are horizontal. Here are some simple yet essential accessories. A tripod. You'll need a tripod to keep the camera or smartphone stable, particularly when filming an interview or when you're taking pictures in low light or at night. Microphone and headphones. Clear audio makes or breaks a video. For interviews, it's best to use a Lavalier microphone that can be clipped onto a character's shirt or dress. This will help you capture the richness of the character's voice and reduce background sounds. Use a good set of headphones to check the audio. Batteries. Also remember to have backup batteries if you are using a digital camera and a portable charger if you are using a smartphone. Soft cloth. 
Remember always to keep your lens clean. A soft cloth is all that's needed. Our third tip is to find the light. Light is everything in photography and filming. And if you're relying on outdoor natural light, as most of us will be in the SWM program, then you have to be mindful about when you go out to shoot. Different times of day obviously have different light. And you need to try and use this light to help convey different feelings to support your story. For example, one type of light is called the golden hour. This is the light around sunrise or sunset. It can help convey calm and happiness. Second, during the middle of the day, when the sun is overhead and at its strongest, the light tends to be harsh. This type of light can help you show tough reality. Third, overcast light on a dull or rainy day create flat images without deep shadows and strong highlights. This type of light can help you show sadness or create a melancholy atmosphere. Finally, there is twilight or dusk, when the sun has just set and before it becomes dark. This can be a special time in the day, which can help you show mystery, emotion and magic. Finding the right light refers not only to the time of day, but also to the best or most appropriate light to show your subject. For example, for portrait shots or interviews, avoid placing your character in front of the light source. If you do, they will appear as a silhouette. Think of the sun as you would a light stand. It should be illuminating your subject, but not from behind. However, be mindful of the sun's position and height in the sky, so your subject is not looking directly into it. To improve your image, also look at the shapes created by shadows and use them to emphasize points of light. As we can see in this example, it can be interesting to have a background in shadow so that a subject emerges from the darkness. To sum up, it's important to plan your shooting day carefully, taking into account the light. <laughs> It's essential that the subject of our photo or video is properly focused and lit. Often you only have one chance to get this right. Exposure is essentially how much light you allow onto the sensor. With too much light, the image will be overexposed, and too little light, it will be underexposed. Here are some good examples and some bad examples. If you are using a smartphone, you can choose the focus point manually by tapping on the screen where the subject appears. This will also adjust the exposure, or how much light is allowed into the frame. On most smartphones, another way to correct the exposure more precisely is using a slider on a graduated line. If you're using a digital camera, a simple way to improve focus is by moving the small rectangle that indicates the point of focus. In automatic mode, this will adjust the focus and also adjust the exposure so that the subject is not too dark or too bright. Of course, if you want to have more control, you can also adjust the exposure manually using the iris thumb wheel. Note the changes in exposure will also affect the depth of field of your picture. This is the zone within a photo that will appear in focus. Our fifth tip is to compose your images carefully. To make your photographs and video footage stronger and more balanced, you should keep the following questions in mind. Where should I put the subject in the frame? And how best can I arrange the elements? There are many rules of composition. 
One of the most well-known and effective ones is the rule of thirds. Here, you divide the frame into nine equal parts using two horizontal lines and two vertical lines. The key is to place your subject along these lines or at the point where these lines intersect. Many smartphones and digital cameras have these grid lines to help you compose, so turn them on. The second rule is to use leading lines. This approach will help you to create a visual journey that leads the viewer from one part of the image to another. Leading lines should take the viewer towards your subject or point of interest. For example, you can use roads, walls or rivers as leading lines, or anything that appears in rows such as lamp posts or planted trees. But don't be tied to the rules either. Learn to experiment and see what works best for you. Composition rules are there to be broken. Tip number six is to film and photograph from a variety of angles. This involves moving around. Find interesting angles rather than relying on the camera zoom. Rather than keeping the camera or smartphone at eye level, film from the ground level upwards or from above to get a bird's eye view. Shooting from below makes the subject more dominant. Shooting from above gives the viewer a feeling of superiority. It's really important to get close up to your subjects. Moving close to show important details and facial expressions, as well as actions and emotions. Use all these tips to help tell your story. It will also help give your audience a different point of view and add interest to the images. Tip number seven builds on the last tip and is about filming sequences of shots. Shooting video is different from taking photographs. You need to think about the different shots you're going to combine and edit together to tell your story. These will become your sequences, which you'll be able to combine with your interviews in the editing. These shots are what are technically called B-roll. During the editing work, B-roll footage will be important to introduce your character in his country, giving strength and concreteness to the interview audio. When you are shooting B-roll, remember to ask yourself what you really need to film in order to show what you want to tell. B-roll usually includes extreme wide shots or wide shots to show where the action is taking place. Medium shots to provide more information and details about your characters and close-up and extreme close-ups of hands, equipment or faces. I can't emphasize enough the importance of close-ups of hands and faces. The more close-ups you can get, the better. Over the shoulder. This is a valuable shot to help show what someone is working on or doing. Remember, a good rule of thumb is to film each clip for a minimum of 10 seconds. When filming, you don't need to move your camera every time. In fact, it is better to keep your camera or smartphone still, ideally using your tripod. The movement or action can then happen inside a fixed frame and you will avoid having shaky footage. If you decide to move your camera, do it smoothly and before doing so, ask yourself, why do you decide to make this movement? is to plan your video interviews carefully. They will be a critical part of your stories. Most of the time you will not have presenters or narrators, so you will need to rely on interviews to tell your story. Here are some basic tips to help make them a success. Plan to do the interview once you have established a relationship with your characters and they're at ease, ideally once you know them. It's so important that they are relaxed and can enjoy the experience. Plan in advance when you want to do the interview and at what time of day, under what type of light and with a background that will not be a distraction. Don't start your interview too late in the day as you may run out of light. <laughs> Make sure there are no background sounds that will disturb the interview, such as car engines or other people talking. Plan a simple camera setup for an interview. 
For example, using the rule of thirds composition, the subject should be looking into the open space of the frame. And compose a mid shot from the waist up to the head. If you're asking the questions, then the interviewee should be talking and looking directly at you and not at the camera. Keep the camera at the same height as the eyes of the interviewee. Place a Lavalier microphone in the subject's clothes, ideally out of sight, just behind the collar or buttons. Double check on your headphones that the microphone does not scratch against them. Plan your questions in advance, but be ready to improvise and ask new questions if the interview takes you down an interesting new path. Ask people to repeat the subject of the question at the beginning of their answer. One trick is to ask them two questions at once, so they will automatically respond with the question. For example, what is your name and where are you from? My name is Cindy and I am from Canada. It's also a good idea to kindly ask them not to use acronyms or jargon. If you're using a smartphone, remember to switch to airplane mode to avoid any calls interrupting the interview. One final yet very important thing to remember is step number nine, and that is to request the consent from the people you photograph and film. You should respect the identity and privacy of anyone being filmed, photographed or named in your stories. You should always explain to them what you will be doing and how the story will be used, and then request their written consent. Ultimately, you are creating part of their online digital fingerprint. Here is the consent form we use on the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program. It shows images to help illustrate what we are asking. It has also been translated into the local language. If you are photographing children, then it's important to seek the consent from an adult who is responsible for the child. In addition to being respectful, our program donors will ask for these consent forms before they are able to use and share our videos and photographs. That's all for now. So thank you for listening to these nine top tips. So just to recap, remember to plan your story, keep your equipment simple, find the light, focus and expose correctly, compose carefully, seek a variety of angles, think sequences when filming, plan your video interviews, be polite and request consent. If you have any doubts or questions, please contact us via email. Above all, go out and enjoy making great photos and videos. Let's go back to questions. If you have some, you can raise your hand or just unmute or put them in the chat. Um, so one that came in earlier, Roger, was an uh, excellent presentation. Wondering how you get your work out to people and who do you present your work to? This is from John. Um, thank you for the question. Um, about over the last three years, I've taken my work and moved it up to a more visible level. Uh, I've got, I've had two websites up. Um, I've got one through an outfit out of New York City or the mid Midwest that uh, has a print on demand service with it, that kind of thing. So I've been making my work more visible that way. Uh, and I've been trying to learn how to effectively use Facebook uh, as a means for promoting my work and connecting people with it. And um, I don't know why, but about three months ago, Facebook shut f my four pages down, including my photography website, the 1942-2016 forest site, and my personal page. So I've been trying to get some reestablishment there that has not been successful. I'm going to follow up with that. 
On the forestry side of your question, uh, this is the first time I've taken this work and bring brought it out into a, a public venue to share with other people. Uh, so heck, you could say this is a bit of a risk for me and not having done this before. I mean, I've done slide talk programs in the past when I was with Cooperative Extension. Some of that was uh, framed in and around forest management ideas and tasks and things like that. But um, this is a whole new thing for me in terms of uh, forest photography. So um, those are the means I've been using to promote some of my work. Um, I've had some successes and some failures in that process that just goes with the territory i guess i'm trying to learn from it working with other people that's how i'm trying to get it out do you have any ideas that way on your part i guess not no one has ideas on that um are you responding to his uh, some ideas, Clay, or do you have a new question? Actually, I've got a uh, perhaps a follow up uh, asking Roger some of the um, processes you've followed. You mentioned you did a photo cruise to uh, get the old growth forest uh, designated as such. Yep. I'm curious how if th those that was presented through some of those um, kind of slide presentations, or I haven't seen many technical reports ever that are photo heavy, I guess. And so perhaps you could give some insights into what you've seen there or produced. Um, on the photo cruise part of it, um, I took and put the 500 images into a distinct folder and went through that, sorted out, uh, pulled out 35 representative images, um, and put that into a document that I forwarded in. I still have that uh, folder of images. I have not I've taken some of the images and I've brought those into my other website, uh, the high quality ones that were tax sharp uh, and that kind of thing. Um, what was the other part of your question or comment? Well, um, kind of from a standpoint, so if I may, before we move on to the next one, you mentioned you selected the 35 images, but I, I presume that was, um, kind of a legislative body, or you, you mentioned, I think, five different uh, organizations you had to kind of convince. Um, and was that just sending the images in a narration with it? Or um, kind of curious what uh, what presentation think, format was effective? Yeah, well, there was it, it, it took a lot of effort to make it become effective. It, this was the first step. This was the first step. Nobody else was doing anything with this. And a friend of mine who and I, who had been exploring this area for about five years, Prior to the time, um, nobody else was doing anything about it. I was. I have some inclination, obviously, orientation old growth forest. So uh, I took the 35 representative images and I put together a three day, a three page field assessment, maps, et cetera, put that into a package. And I sent it to five state agencies that had a relationship. To what was going on uh, at the time, and that was like uh, the Department of Forestry, that was like the uh, Natural Resources Council. It was. I also sent a, a copy of it to the the forest landowner who was going to harvest it. So I disseminated the information. To be honest with you, I didn't hear back for some time, and I began to really kind of wonder what the hell's going on here. Because this was right in the middle when they were doing a review of the landowners' long-term plans and conservation easement in the region. So I eventually made contact with somebody who was in the conservation arena organizationally, uh, been a former state employee, and he was very helpful in bringing and listening to my concerns and and my concern was that this 200 acres was like a drop in a bucket because the larger landscape was all young forest that had been harvested and that this was a unique and very different area so we emphasized that i never went to any hearings he took it on and worked it through his connections he has he, he's passed away since, but he, he had a really good gift of being able to connect with people and, and have conversations about these things. And eventually some of the state agency people showed up in the review, the landowners review, and 
took the position that it was unique uh, in its context that way. And so when the conservation easement with overall was reviewed, uh, this area was left as no harvest. And then three years later, that expectation got written into the deed in the courthouse that this 200 acre forest is to stay forest in perpetuity. So, and believe me, there were a lot of other things that happened in between because uh, then somebody got a hold of this and sent it to their friend down in Portland, Maine, which is another center in the state. And all of a sudden, there's all these people showing up there saying, where's the old growth forest? We want to see it, you know? So eventually, uh, there were some informal tours that were conducted. That was also part of what influenced. So uh, that's kind of the, the broader social matrix of what was going on with this. It took some time to get through it. Yeah, good question. Thank you for the exposition on that. Uh, I think that, that leads well then to my other half of the question, which was um, technical reports. Uh, so I think, as you mentioned, I'm a private landowner. Uh, and so I try to write a uh, forest report every year for the Colorado State Forest Service. We've got forest agriculture as a tax designation. And mm -hmm. normally it could just be a written report of what I did. You know, I thinned so many acres, I sold so many cords of wood. Um, but to me, that seems very uh, weak, I guess, to explain, like, this is the forest and how it's managed. And after the forest fire, which was caused by uh, human action, it was really helpful to go back on my decade of photography of the photo and of the forest and say, here's how this change has affected things. Mm. But I've not seen many photo heavy reports to build off of. Well, you, you bring up an interesting point. Um, and it certainly has somewhat of a personal connection to me in terms of how I learn. I can remember back uh, before the year 2000, I believe it was, there was a uh, psychological, social psychological, intellectual researcher that did the research on the on the seven centers of intelligence, which revealed people do not learn just by simply lecturing or reading text. And uh, one of the school superintendents was on the board of the county commissioners along with me. And he and I got into conversation about this very topic, about well, all of these technical papers and all these technical verbal presentations. He said, these people don't get it. The, only about 20% of the audience is getting the spoken word. And only another 20% at the most is getting it by um, reading means. Because he said, these other ways that we learn there's other portions of the population that are oriented that way and that for me personally and intellectually kicked the door open because then i began to see that i was very strongly visually oriented to understanding things and how they work and in forestry my god there, there's the i i appreciate the the work the the the, the thought and the research and the effort that goes into it but if there are key points or connections that can be illustrated, um, I think that can help the comprehension and understanding. Because uh, I and I've been through a few rounds recently of some meetings on climate change, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm not a I'm, I'm not a current age forester, but I'm kind of cords and logs forester from that era. But I'm sitting there thinking. The way they're framing this, it, it's not miss, it's not hitting anybody's head. It's not hitting their heart. And I think you have to have a, I think developing some human connections in this and and exploring ways to visually address these. I, um, I'm kind of jumping around here, but I just remembered something. Um, in the University of Maine, uh, the, in their creative arts program, They've got some people that have been doing some illustrations of the complexities of climate change. And, and just without getting into the details, all right, all the layers and the this is and the that's and the influences and the this is and that, they've been employing students, PhD level candidates from the School of Art into beginning to develop creative means of conveying the whole picture here. And I've seen some examples in a large scale a uh, large scale painting that was probably three feet by four feet. It was about the ocean, Gulf of Maine, warming, what's changing. And the artist captured that 
And that's one of the beauties of, of a hand artist because they can choose what to put in and where to put it and then relate that to the other elements, which goes with climate change and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. The arts have a place in this. I've been talking to a fellow who's uh, the head of the, the uh, uh, school forestry research unit. He and I've been talking about it. He's interested, he's interested in the, the marriage of the two in, in a way that can help people understand beyond what you've framed, you know, 20 page text report. That report's important. I'm not dismissing it, but can we bring something in with that? Sort of like what I did with the verbal visual stories in the beginning, going through some of those short sequences and adding details into it. They're, all, they're about forest, but it's also about the photography and the angle and the shift and the sequence. So I think there's a place for it. And uh, I know you have a photographic interest. Do I ever get the door open on something like this? I'll keep you, I'll keep you posted or if anybody else is interested, I'd be glad to keep the conversation going because I think it could really help the scientific presentation of things. That definitely sounds very cool. Hmm. Thank you, Clay. Um, we have another question in chat, Roger. Uh, what editing programs do you use? Oh. <laughs> I basically... I use two editing programs. One is uh, Photoshop Elements. Uh, that's not a professional level program, so to speak, but I can take the Google Earth images and the less than stellar images, and I can do some editing through that in a fairly rapid order. So I use that. Um, I also... Uh, been using Luminar. I tried to learn Lightroom, but my brain just couldn't handle it. So I stepped back from that. And when Luminar came along, um, I've been working with that, and it has been a, a helpful tool in editing my higher quality images, like that I'm going to put on my website. And I have a new version of that that I'm learning now. But I used I used two programs like that. And there's another program I I, I need to mention. And that is on the iPhone, because uh, when you go into iPhone and you open up uh, your photos up in the upper right corner, it says edit. And you open that edit up and there's a series of editing functions that you can employ for that particular image. So you've already got an editing program like I do on my iPhone uh, built into that. And you, you can, it's as simple as when you open the editing program up. The first selection is auto. Auto takes the light, the color, the this and that, and does a kind of a generalized uh, edit of that whole image that way. And then you can tweak it after that with contrast, with a little more sharpness, et cetera. So with editing, that's what I've been doing. Photoshop Elements, Luminar, and using the iPhone. Great. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to bring your attention to the chat. I just put two links in there. One is to the Forest Stewards Guild webinar library on our website, and the other one is to the Forest Stewards Guild channel on YouTube. Um, any last question before we close tonight or comment? I really, really want to thank Roger for all of the work put into this presentation. Uh, he's been incredibly enthusiastic since uh, I reached out to him about it. So um, we really appreciate you sharing all of your expertise here. And there's some questions about uh, SAF credit procedures. I will be sending, um, I'm going to stop the recording here. I will be uh, sending the um, list of registrants